Good morning. My name is Richard Phillips. I'm the Dean of the J. Mack Robinson College of Business at Georgia State University. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to our session this morning on blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Um, I, we have, uh, we're starting a little late this morning, but I understand we're going to go a little late, so we won't be shortchanging, no pun intended, this <laughs> session. Um, I have with me today two uh, uh, experienced gentlemen in this technology. To my immediate left is Dr. Sanjay Srivastava. Dr. Srivastava is my colleague at Georgia State University. He is the Associate Dean of Strategy and Special Projects at the Robinson College of Business. His role at the Robinson College is to create new strategic initiatives for the college. In that role, he is the inaugural director of Robinson's Institute for Insight, which is a unique applied computer science department that we have created in the last couple of years that's been built inside of the business school, which is bringing the engineering and innovation mindset into business, into our business school. And earlier this year, he was the founding director of our first, the first FinTech Innovation Lab in the state of Georgia. He started his career at Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business, where he's launched a number of initiatives while he was there, including the first computational finance program anywhere in the world. That program quickly became the number one program in the world, and is still the number one program in the world today. Dr. Srivastava has a PhD in economics from MIT. To his left, please welcome Dr. Srivastava. <laughs> to his left is Glenn Sarvati. Uh, Glenn is the managing principal of 154 Advisors, where he is a consultant to payment processors here in Atlanta and to the fintech industry here in the state of Georgia. Previously, Glenn uh, worked for Deluxe Corporation, Check Free, and as a consultant with McKinsey, as well as other uh, as well as other companies in the fintech industry. Uh, Glenn describes himself as not a technologist, which will be good for, I'm sure, many of us in the room, including myself, but instead as a business strategist. Uh, Glenn is uh, from my alma mater, uh, the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, and, um, uh, and is, uh, please help me welcome Glenn to the stage this morning. I'm sure if you're like me, um, you've heard the terms uh, blockchain and Bitcoin and um, just don't quite know exactly what that means. Um, so by a show of hands, I thought I'd just put, make us all feel at ease. If you're not exactly sure what a blockchain is, could you raise your hand and I'll start? All right, good. Um, so Dr. Shavastava, if I can ask you to put your professor hat on for just a minute. Could you please explain to us what a blockchain is? Sure. Uh, uh, so a bo blockchain is a distributed ledger technology. What exactly does that mean? Uh, think of a ledger as a book which has every transaction recorded in it. Uh, and that's an important part of a blockchain is that the entire history of transactions is recorded. Uh, in, in that's why it's called a blockchain. It's, you build a block with all the history of the transactions. A distributed ledger means that there are multiple copies of this ledger that are held by a variety of different types of people. The, uh, uh, so in its very essence, it's simply a way to record transactions. Uh, how it's deployed, however, can be different, and what types of uses you can make for it could be different. So you can have this ledger and it's distributed. One of the questions is how do you add transactions to the ledger? So a simple transaction could be, that I want to transfer some money to, to Glenn. And uh, so I would, what I do in a blockchain is I initiate a transaction and I say I want to send money to, to Glenn. Uh, there's a way to validate whether I have the money to send to him and whether I've already sent it to somebody else. Oops. Uh, the, uh, and that validation process differs across different blockchain implementations exactly how that uh, validation takes place and how, the, how we reach some consensus that this transaction is going to be put on the blockchain. So Bitcoin has one way of doing it, and Ripple has another way of doing it, and so on. There, these are just different blockchains. 
uh, once a transaction is, is validated and entered into the blockchain, it's there forever, right? And now there are multiple, multiple copies of it, and that's part of the security feature of, of, uh, of blockchain is that in order for you to really manipulate it, you'd have to manipulate a lot of different copies of this ledger at the same time. Another big piece is the encryption, is that when a transaction is entered, it is encrypted, and uh, that encryption is is uh, governed by lots of things, but a key part of it is a private key that the initiator of the transaction has. Think of it as your email password, for example. Uh, if somebody gets hold of your private key, uh, you're done for, okay? So, uh, so the, the, the security that you get from the distributed network is only as good for you as how secure your private key is. Okay? And there've been instances, if you look back at some of the instances of breaches, uh, many of them have been uh, because, of, uh, because of somebody not being able to protect their, their private key. Okay? Uh, the, the third part of a blockchain is, to, is, is, the, uh, is the financing of it, if you like, which is how does, who maintains this network? Right? Who, how do you, who pays for this? Uh, and there again, you have different models. So in Bitcoin, what you do is that if you can solve a puzzle, you, get, you earn some money. That's called mining. Uh, and there are millions of copies of these, right? And in order for a transaction to be entered into it, uh, somebody, a pool of people have to agree. It could be you could require a majority, you could have a unanimity, or you could designate people who are the ones who will say this is a valid transaction, and then it gets added on, right? And then the third piece is how do you pay to maintain this, this entire system? Hopefully that's... Uh, an explanation, right? The millions of notebooks with everything recorded in them, and that's, right? And then the encryption, which gives you much more private uh, security, and the distribution, which gives you much more public security. It has lots of implications. Uh, for example, you can verify transactions without having to know the private key of somebody. So I could check that I have enough money in my bank account to, play, get, to pay Glenn, but I don't have to know, you don't have to know exactly how much money I have. Glenn, anything to add? Yeah, I think that's one of the best, and that's why you're a professor. I mean, that's one of the best descriptions I've heard that really lays it out very uh, succinctly. Just a couple of things to add, and one of the things that I think you kind of said, but just to reinforce, is that there's Bitcoin and there's blockchain. They're related, but they're not the same thing. Bitcoin is a currency that runs on the blockchain network. There are many other uses, not just, we talk about transactions. Transactions don't necessarily have to involve currency and financial transactions, there's other types. And we'll get into that as well. And the other thing you mentioned about private key, and if someone else gets yours, you're in trouble. If you can't find your private key, there's no, you know, there's no call center that you can go back to to find it either, which can be a challenge. One of the things, if uh, anybody watches the Big Bang Theory, that's, you know, to me, one great example of just how mainstream this has gotten is when an entire episode of the Big Bang Theory is based around them losing their private key to their blockchain. That's, that's when you know if some of this stuff is really taking off. Um, and the one other thing, just to mention, again, when you talk about things like Bitcoin, uh, there's a difference between public and private blockchains. And you also mentioned about the mining, which is an exercise to create the incentive for all the miners to provide the data capacity and the computing capacity to keep the network running. So most of the places you hear about it today tend to be around the, the cryptocurrencies, which are public blockchains. There's also a whole series, and again, we'll probably get more into this, of private blockchains. And I think that's a lot where you're going to see much more immediate traction and success in the business world. And it's basically a small, they also call them permissioned blockchains. You know, everybody who's involved, it's a closed network who agrees to work on something like this. Um, in that case, by the fact that you've agreed to join the network, you've basically already acknowledged you have an incentive. So people are already providing the power of the blockchain. You don't need some kind of a currency and a monetary incentive. Your incentive comes from the fact that presumably you're running your business more efficiently. Um, you're saving money in terms of the way you're processing transactions on the back end. And you also mentioned distributed ledger. Again, I think, I don't know if you would agree, I think of distributed ledger and blockchain for the most part is relatively synonymous. And then currencies like Bitcoin ride on top of those. So you. Uh, Dr. Shavasva, you talked about transferring money from Glenn, or from you to Glenn. Well, maybe uh, the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, uh, normally, we would do that with a bank. Um, what's the role for a bank or a financial intermediary in so the world in, with a blockchain? Yeah, so in, in principle, you can, I can transfer money to, uh, to Glenn, or he could 
maybe give me some, uh, without uh, any intermediary. Right? We simply, uh, we, I put forward a transaction saying I want to give uh, Glenn $10. And it's verified that this is a legitimate transaction, a valid transaction. I have the money in my account, and then it automatically takes place, and we don't need any intermediary. One of the differences, if, if you will permit me, with, uh, between kind of current systems and, and an analogy to the distributed ledger is, is uh, the way we work today is that we really have different ledgers. So, so Glenn's bank has its own ledger with his accounts, and my bank has all of my ledger. And in order for us to transact, we have to, we have to go through these intermediaries uh, because they have control over, over my account and my, and my history. When we have these public networks like this, you take away that role of that intermediary. And I think that's one of the powerful aspects of this, that it could potentially lead to a lot of disintermediation uh, as, uh, as people are able to trade or exchange products or, or, and so on much more directly in using one of these. Uh, uh, of course, you need acceptance and, and people to buy into this. And so, you know, if I transfer some coin to Glenn, uh, the value of it could come either because he thinks the value of this will go up or, you know, in a speculative way, or it could be because it's actually used in some, for some economic purpose. And I would point on that one, too, when we talk about cryptocurrency, I mean, it, you really get back to the fundamental de definition of a currency, and it really serves two different and important purposes. It's a, mean, a means of exchanging value, and it's also a store of value. And, you know, in my view, and again, this is not a knock against cryptocurrency, because I think that the concept is very strong, but I think we're still at the stage of baby steps. There's only so many places that actually accept Bitcoin right now or Ethereum or whatever other cryptocurrency you're talking about. So as an exchange of value, it's still not been necessarily the strongest. It's used, but mainly from people who are really kind of early adopter, bleeding edge kind of uh, techies who really are trying to prove a point. Um, store of value, I mean, I think in many cases, a lot of the attention to it has been because of you know, the get rich quick investment aspect where, and, and again, if you know, one of the things when you keep money in a bank account, and you know, it, you, you want to know that the money you have today is going to be the money you can spend tomorrow. Well, you take a look at Bitcoin having been $19,000 uh, each back in December and fell below 8000 yesterday. Kind of hard to argue that it's a, a great store of value with that kind of volatility. Having said that, there's plenty of currencies in uh, you know, Latin American countries and devaluations and other places that have had similar rocky roads. But again, the fact that there's no government behind it creates probably a little bit of an added level of uncertainty there. So uh, let's move to, after defining it, um, uh, maybe uh, each of you could talk about some areas where you think about application of blockchain a little bit. So let's start with, uh, Glenn, why don't you uh, tell me uh, one or two areas where yeah. you think of productive use for blockchain. Yeah, and I'll purposely go away from the dollars and cents aspect and talk about places where I think blockchain can really be used for other reasons. And one of them, I actually, it, they never used the word blockchain, but in the primary session this morning with SAP Ariba, Marcel mentioned that concept of slave labor and making sure that there's a you know, direct chain to understand what your supply chain, and I'll just use the phrase supply chain management, which is one of those private blockchain applications that can, I, I think, makes a lot of sense, where you know exactly what the source, and this could be for food safety, this could be for any kind of fabrication in, in factories in, in other countries and things like that, where you can clearly track the source of where your, your product is coming from. So the blockchain provides an efficient way to really wring out those types of labor abuses. Um, a similar situation, I was at a conference uh, last fall and it was a hackathon. And again, this was something that was just done on a bootstraps basis in like 48 or 72 hours, but I thought it was fascinating. A group came up with a blockchain-based application called Blood Buddy, which I thought was just brilliant. And the whole idea was, and again, one of the places where blockchain can be really useful is this whole notion of chain of custody just like we just talked about, where you really can track things right from the start. Their idea was for do blood donations, from the point of donation, being able to track to assure the quality, the purity, that there's no tampering, you know, the blood type and whatnot, and take it through every step of the distribution process from where it was collected to where it's actually utilized. Again, I think it makes a ton of sense. It's probably a, a more manageable application because there's a limited number of uh, locations there's a motivation of the blood you know, donation centers as well as the hospitals to really get involved in it, as opposed to having to deal with millions of consumers on each side. Dr. Sarasva? So, 
So let me give you a, a different example that builds on the chain of custody uh, idea. Uh, this is something we're actually actively working on in, the, in, in, our, in our FinTech lab, which is we're working on digital rights management. So uh, just a little tiny bit of background. Uh, in uh, virtual reality games and, 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 and uh, virtual reality modern games, you have uh, people who create digital assets of some type. So for example, I could create a, a glass and use it in my, in my game. Uh, I can now sell that glass to you to use in your game, right? And you may use the glass as is, or you may change it a little bit, right? And one of the advantages of the blockchain is that we can track the entire history of what happened to it, right? So I can, so as future versions of this glass uh, emanate through, uh, through time and through different applications, oh, sorry. Uh, through different applications, you can, uh, uh, you can track your ownership and, and the portions of it that you still own. So suppose, uh, you know, Glenn changed it by 25%. I still have 75% ownership of this original object that was created. And I think one of the beauties of the blockchain is that you can, you can maintain this entire track of what happened to, to, this, to this product. And uh, for something like uh, pay, payment of royalties or, or something like that, it provides a very natural mechanism uh, for people to have much, much more control over things that they have created. And, and I think uh, this is, I think a big part of what excites me about it is the, is the fact that it puts, it gives me a lot more control of the ownership of things that I've created, and it gives me a lot more control of the ownership of transactions that I've initiated and so on. Uh, and it allows, uh, so it just allows for a range of possibilities of things that have been very difficult to do uh, in the past, right? And you talk about intermediation. If I sell, if I give the rights to my, say, music or some other creative media to somebody, to some company, uh, it's very hard for me to track uh, uh, any, what happens to it as, as it goes forward. And I think this is a natural technology for us to be able to do that. And one place where we saw that already in the press, you may have seen, in fact, Kodak came up as one of the companies that's been totally kind of broken by this whole business model. They announced early this year a digital rights management based on the blockchain. Uh, and again, it's, it's an interesting concept, and they're doing it in partnership with somebody else, where photographers who basically, you know, once they put their photos out in the world, people use them and may not give them attribution and pay them royalties and whatnot. So the idea is it's basically a digital watermark, and they're working with a company that already has a vast library of these photos, and you can track them and understand where they're being used. I think it's a great application for that kind of thing. Taking it a step further, I think it popped the stock because it just gave them a great chance to talk about it. They showed up in blockchain searches. They built an initial coin offering around it, which we can probably get into that a little bit later. I, I think people got a little bit ahead of themselves, but at the fundamental level, I think that's kind of what you're talking about and I think a great use. One of the things that's been in the news um, this past week has been Facebook and uh, the um, information that privacy information that we all own on ourselves, or demographic information. Um, what's the potential application for um, controlling our own data as individuals with I, the I blockchain? Th I think huge. Sorry. Massive. The, the, uh, uh, the, uh, if, if you haven't looked, there's, there are various companies that are starting up which, are, uh, which will help you protect your, uh, your data. The one is called Data Wallet. You may want to, want to look at that. Uh, but basically what happens is that if you think about the structure of, this, of these, these, uh, these transactions, you initiate them. So for example, I could say that I want this part of my data to be released to Glenn, but no other part, right? And then I could charge you for that, for that data. I think the potential for us to control both our data and who gets access to it is going to be something that can potentially uh, be a, a revolutionary change in in the use of the, in the use of by the use of this technology. Yeah, I think identity is a natural, and it's one of the places that people have put a lot of energy into looking into it. Probably a little more complicated, again, just because of the sheer number of endpoints and getting people bought into the concept and adopting. Um, but I do a lot of work with credit unions. If, if you're not familiar, credit unions are basically member-owned versions, nonprofit versions of banks. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's worth taking a look as we talk about financial and community empowerment and reinvesting in the community. Definitely something worth looking into. Uh, and I know credit unions have looked into this whole notion. There's an initiative that they've done collaboratively called CU Ledger, 
that looks exactly at this issue. And they're the, one, the first thing that they're really looking to approach is the idea of identity, where you know, it brings the actual control back to the individual to say, I want to verify that I am who I am, so you'll do business with me, but I have the ability to turn that off and on and decide what I want to share with you. So again, it's, it's a bigger exercise. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's a, it's a really interesting use case. I have one more question, and then we'll open it up for the audience. Um, we're at a John Bryant Hope conference, and so we should be talking a little bit about financial inclusion. Uh, what is the what is the possibility for the application in blockchain to increase the possibility for economic inclusion? I think again, it's it's more you know down the road. But if you think about again the idea that you've got you know. A, a, in this country, you still have, you know, depending on the statistics, you want to look at 10 to 20 percent of uh, consumers are either unbanked or underbanked. And one of the challenges that we run into is that banks say that you know it's we can't profitably serve members of the of the community, uh, and obviously that that number is significantly higher when you get into other developing countries. Uh, and sometimes there's just surely not access to financial services and bank branches and whatnot. Well, as we move on to the blockchain, as you just mentioned, that you don't have to maintain individual ledgers and whatnot, uh, um, we, we can go into the point of you know, finding a way to more efficiently serve a broader number of consumers and therefore wind up being able to bring in greater financial inclusion. There's already a use that's being one of the more common uses of the blockchain is for cross-border transactions whether business to business or consumers, where again, there may not be another way to get money from two different countries, and whether it's you know, a foreign you know, migrant worker who's sending money back home to his family or doing some type of a business transaction. In many cases, this may be the most efficient way today to get it from one place to the other. So again, a lot of great opportunities to bring more people into the mix. I just add a little bit to that, which is uh, the, uh, uh, we have an ability for, uh, through the technology for groups of people to, to behave collectively. Uh, there's a whole area of, of smart contracts. We haven't talked much about it today. But so for example, a group of us could get together uh, and decide that we want to buy something. Just, just that'll keep the financial thing. We want to buy some stocks, okay? And each of us contributes a, uh, a small amount of money into a pool, the pool is kept on the blockchain, the smart contract manages all of the payouts and so on once you're in it. Uh, this allows a small group to have access and to set up their own little pool of capital and be able to do, and to be able to do tr transactions. Uh, those things are difficult to do uh, if you don't have enough, enough capital or if you don't have, you can't pay the transaction costs of intermediaries and so on. So here, you have the opportunity for lots of, of people with, uh, with uh, small amounts of money, for example, or small resources to be able to participate uh, and to, oh, thank, sorry, uh, to be able to participate in, in, in collectives, for example, uh, which would be very difficult to organize today in another way. So uh, one other example would be that suppose that we live in a community and we want to build something which is of common use. Uh, we could write a smart contract where everybody has to contribute some amount, and if the amount is not enough to pay for this, all the money gets automatically returned and put, put back into your individual accounts. That kind of thing is difficult today. You'd have to set up an escrow account, you'd have to have some level of trust and so on. And I think these mechanisms allow you to bypass some of those. That's, that's a really great example, and I think smart contracts, again, is one of the areas you hear talked about a lot, and it can really even allow for things to be done in a more complex fashion than they are today. Uh, and you know, going back to a business setting, if you want to release a payment, it may be you set up a rule that says three of this list of seven people have to approve the, for this payment to be released. And rather than having to run around with the piece of paper, or even having the way it does today where it routes it from individual to individual in an inbox, you know, everybody can go out there and the systems already knows that, okay, once I have three of those signatures, or it has to be at least one of these two and one of these others, boom, the payment goes out. Or you know, as your point, in escrow, if you, if you know you're doing a transaction and it just has to be a certain number of conditions that are met, once those conditions are met, the rest of it just executes. Great. So we'll take uh, questions from the audience. There's a microphone that's coming around. If you uh, have a question, please raise your hand and we will try to. Uh, okay, answer. I'll take the first question. Microsoft, a couple days ago, just uh, helped launch um, a blockchain investment product built on Azure, and I was interested, because that company is called, I think it's Navara, 
and they're out of the UK. So what are the implications, or you think, on blockchains and what's going on with GDPR and its effect in the US? Well, just to, if, if anybody's not familiar with that phrase, GDPR is the general data privacy regulation that's already taken place in the UK and the European Union. Well, which again is, you know, one, the place that it's probably heard about most often is the whole notion of the right to be forgotten. And it comes up sometime in Facebook and whatnot where a consumer says, I'm off, you can't just keep my stuff, you need to be able to prove that you have taken me off the system. That's the best known aspect of it. But there's other aspects of privacy regulation. We were already just talking off, uh, you know, offline that uh, one of the challenges if you travel to Europe right now and you use your browser, you know, it didn't happen to me. I think you have to have a European, you know, registered phone for it to actually kick in. You've got a lot new kind of click through and agree to these terms and conditions that you have to say that you understand how your data is being used because these are the new types of regulations that are being put in place. I would have thought that the way this country works, that you know, how difficult we have, the difficulty we have of passing any new regulations and kind of the aversion that we tend to have to regulation in general, I did not think the GDPR was likely to be passing here. Then the whole Facebook thing happened. Yeah. And I think that the odds of something like that going on are much greater. And again, blockchain would be a natural way to really put that in place. Um, my, my personal bet is the threat of legislation will probably cause the industry to do something that winds up getting us to roughly the same place without it literally being mandated by, by law. But we'll, we'll see where that plays out. Sir? Okay, my name is Eric Richner looking at this and uh, with the forum. And one particular thing of uh, confusion that most people would like to probably to understand is the ICOs. And for example, if Hope decided to create a FICO alternative so that you can test, you know, is this a good person to loan the money? And uh, what, you know, would Hope issue an ICO? I mean. What are the barriers of entry? I mean, this is, you go to GitHub, you get access to blockchain, you can create your own currency. Do you just have a marketplace that people will say, this is a good thing, a good use, so that you have a lot of people? So what happens with the ICO? Would Hope this be the sponsor? How does that work? Okay. You want to take that or should I um, Again, it, ICO, and I think, th thank you for bringing that up because I think that's one of the most un misunderstood is people start to get a little more comfortable with the notion of Bitcoin and blockchain. I think ICO is kind of the next frontier where there's a lot of misunderstanding. We hear initial coin offering, and I think a lot of people, just because it sounds that way, thinks about, think about initial public offerings with IPOs. They're really not the same thing at all. There's a couple of different categories, and I was pleasantly surprised it was actually somebody who was very strongly into the Bitcoin world who was the one that teed it up. And ICO is much more like a Kickstarter campaign, if you really think about it. People kind of assume because of the name that you're buying an equity stake in whatever it is. That is usually, in most cases, not the case with an ICO. So you have to be very careful in terms of what you're getting on the other side of that offering. Uh, in some cases, they're offering a new coin. And if that new coin winds up doing what Bitcoin did and you know, shooting through the roof, then you may wind up doing very well. The question is, what is the reason that that, that, that coin would have additional value? In most cases, what they're really selling you, it's again, very much like Kickstarter, they're selling you a promise of some future delivery of service of whatever it is they're looking to build. And then once that product is delivered, you will have this coin that allows you to exchange it and actually receive that service. Now, the way I think about that, unless it's some kind of a scarce resource, and one example of that would be Venezuela talked about doing this, and they were going to back their coins with their reserves of oil that had not yet been extracted from the ground. Well, oil is a limited resource, so you can make an argument that that would have an additional value. You can also make an argument, do you want to trust the country of Venezuela to actually follow <laughs> through on that? But I understand at least that concept. But in most cases, if someone's looking to start a business, they're probably looking to create a relatively unlimited supply of that product. And therefore, other than I think people's misunderstanding, there's really not a lot of reason for the value of those coins to go up. Now, to your point about more broadly in terms of where hope might get involved, it would be a source of fundraising. Um, I think there's a lot more to kind of you know, get into in terms of you know, identity and management as far as that, as far as how that might play. 
But uh, you know, it, again, if people were really understanding that what they were buying into, I mean, it would be a way of doing it. I'm not positive it would be the most efficient way. So in this particular case, the FICO replacement, which is just trust that uh, yeah. you, you had repaid whatever you loan, there's no need for currency, it's just a blockchain part of it, or you see, there's a lot of confusion between bitcoins and these currencies to what is the actual use of the technology like in a blockchain. So a blockchain is the ledger, right? So if we have a way of recording this, transactions to validate that you are um, credit worthy, right? So what would be, would there be a coin for it or, or, or it's just the, you participate in the network of being able to look at the ledger if, and, and you pay for that access? How, how does that work? Any, any thoughts there? Sanjay, you want me to go ahead? Uh, it, one thought that I have on that one is, you know, the, the whole issue if you start talking about it in terms of FICO is the reason that FICO is, you know, an accepted, you know, you know solution credit score is that it's widely accepted across the board. It's, it's a network effect. So if you got enough people to do this and accept that product, I think that clearly the notion of credit scoring would be another natural application that you could use the blockchain for it. And again, this is kind of back to that point of you know, breaking out the difference between blockchain and Bitcoin. You, know, you could fund the investment to make that happen a lot of different ways. You could use the coin to do that. You could just, you know, as John seems to be very good at doing, getting some seven-figure checks from a bunch of people and funding it that way too. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure how to answer the question beyond that, but to me, that's, I would draw the distinction. I think there's a use case, but I'd take the investment separately. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have several questions in the audience. We have about 10 minutes left, and we're gonna run the mics accordingly. So this young lady, please. Hi, my name is Alicia Newton. And uh, I wanna dial it back a little bit. You talked about the um, opportunity for blockchain to provide access to financial services and underserved places in the world, and you talked about collectives uh, for financial, financial collectives, and I thought about India and some of the things that are happening there, and looking at the trends in places like Africa being these huge emerging markets. My question is, how would someone actually access this technology? I mean, like, where would uh, someone who needed to set up a blockchain ledger, like who would they call, who are the providers, how do you get in? Uh, so just like to hear a little bit more about those steps. Okay. Well, I mean, it's just a network of computers connected by the internet at its, at its core. And then there are various technologies, uh, Ethereum is one, which allows you to set up your own private blockchain. Uh, you know, a few blocks down the street uh, or up the, up the street, we have our, our private blockchain and we have our own token to, for, as a unit of exchange. Uh, so, it's, so I'm not completely sure I'm answering your question, but uh, the ability to create a private blockchain is really easy. I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy to do. I think the more difficult part is to get people to agree to be part of your or to adopt your blockchain and to provide some value to the people who are in it. But creating it basically is very simple. I'll maybe just amend that a little bit. It's simple if you have techno technical capabilities. I think, you know, if, if, if you, if, you know, I'm just thinking about the way the internet started. I mean, you know, you've got the people who really understood the stuff who could play, you know, and set things up and figure out how to connect in their offices, you know, for a long time before AOL and CompuServe and all these other people came on. You've got companies that are starting to crop up in the world now that I was just at a conference in London called Finnovate where several of these, I mean, like even the idea of spending Bitcoin, if you want to spend Bitcoin, you know, there's other ways you could do it if you're like a real, you know, gearhead that really works on these things, but there's companies like Coinbase or BitPay here in Atlanta that, uh, that does those type of things. So these smaller companies that actually do have the consumer facing application are cropping up. And I think that that would be if you're looking to use it for more of a community based application, having somebody who's already kind of set up some of that fundamental foundation that you can plug into can probably show you the ropes and probably even help you help maybe you get you know, some of that network set up. Yeah. I'll just add to that. Um, so the blockchain runs on top of the internet, right? So it's the same as plugging into the internet. And there's certain, there's certain languages that you're using to program on the blockchain. Um, but 
But fundamentally, as Sanjay said a minute ago, you know, we at Georgia, at Georgia State in our lab, we're running our own blockchain inside of a room, you know, on 20 computers, um, and we set it up with a bunch of students in the afternoon. Um, so it's it's not a difficult thing to do, as Glenn said, if you have the technical capabilities to set the programs up, um, and if you, you know. If you'd like to take a boot camp on a Saturday afternoon, we'd love to have you. <laughs> yeah. uh, can I add just one little thing? Uh, you were asking about, we were, we were talking about inclusion and, and new business models and, and a little bit so on. I think it's, a lot of our focus today has been on solving existing problems like, like uh, currency transfer and so on. I think it's difficult to, uh, I think it's not good to focus on that. I think if you thought about 20 years ago, if you would have predicted that we would have a sharing economy with Uber and so on because of the internet, uh, I think there'd be very few people who would predict that. So I think the, the as we go forward and we learn more about the technology, about its uh, advantages, drawbacks, and so on, we're probably going to get very different types of businesses appearing. Uh, which take advantage of, say, the, the uh, digital identities and, and, and so on uh, in ways, I, I don't know, not clear to me we can really imagine what, what some of those may be. That's, that's a really good point. I mean, yes, yeah, someone's just created a whole bunch of building blocks and kind of put them out in the world and said, go see what you can do with them. Kind of the same way, you know, when you know, the Apple uh, App Store, you know, and the Google, you know, Google Play came opened and you could just go out and figure out, same thing with Alexa right now. Okay, here's a great little uh, tool figure out ways you can apply it. And there's probably gonna be a lot of new ways that we haven't even thought of today because it's solving issues that we didn't even know we had. So gentlemen, we have about four minutes left. We've got about six people who have questions. So let's keep all of our questions very, to the, very much to the point and quick. Good afternoon, thank you for being here, or morning. Um, the professor mentioned um, as a product, the glass, and then you're following the history of the glass. So you can give me a quick answer on this one. So um, following the history, and you have people that are using the blockchain, what if they change the use of the glass to a vase? And then so does that change the history? And is this technology working parallel with the patents that are already out there, or only new? Is it coexisting, or is it only new software so or things? So this is a new use for, for something. I'm not completely sure how it would uh, square with patent laws and things like that. Uh, but the important piece here is that the way in which I transfer my glass, my virtual glass to you, uh, has, a contract, has a contract that's written in it, right? And to the extent that it can envisage that you may transform this into a vase, uh, is uh, uh, we, we would have to write that contingency into, into the contract, right? So we would have to specify uh, what constitutes a material change, and you know, if you change it a lot, what, what are the ownership rights of the, of, the, of the piece that's remaining and still attributable to me? Yeah. Okay. Hi, good after, good morning. Um, I think you started to answer some of my question earlier, but my main, I guess, point of question is, what are the simple points of entry for people who are really interested, like all the people in here who many people don't know very much about this but are interested in thinking about opportunities, um, particularly as we think forward about massive disrup disruption of employment with AI and how there'll be a lot of unemployment, like, I guess I'm trying to think about what opportunities there are to learn. You talked about um, boot camps, but is there sort of going to be, or is there right now, um, more broad opportunities for easy points of access beyond just investing in what somebody else has already established? So ladies and gentlemen, we have one minute left. I'll let the panelists answer that last question, and I'm sure the speakers would love to speak with you after. I'll take it where you want me to. So, um, so obviously the world is changing rapidly. Um, uh, so now I'll pitch higher education. Um, uh, so certainly there's degree programs you can come back and take, but if you've already got your advanced degrees, there's opportunities to come back and take uh, non-degree programs, but I encourage you to look at the online uh, degree or non-degree programs as well that 
we offer at Georgia State or that are available on Coursera or edX or you know, there's many, many opportunities to educate yourselves um, on uh, uh, online educational opportunities. Um, but there's opportunities to come back and just network inside of universities today. Um, at Georgia State, we've established recently um, an entrepreneurship and innovation institute um, to come back and build community around what are the new technologies and how are these technologies going to create innovation, um, uh, innovative new businesses and new business models. So we've talked here about, you know, um, digital assets that can be created for artists. But there's lots of other opportunities as well. Um, and it's really about just getting out there and networking with people and understanding what those uh, possibilities are. One of the reasons I introduced Glenn as not a technologist, but as a business strategist, is because you don't have to be a technologist to understand what those opportunities are. But you do have to be willing to get out there and get uncomfortable and understand what the possibilities are and think creatively. But it's a wonderful time to be alive and think about those opportunities. But you definitely can't just sit by the side and, and watch it happen. Yeah, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't program one of these things to save my life. But uh, <laughs> having said that, and I'll just say this really quickly, uh, if, if you want to get your hands dirty, boot camps, Georgia State, abs absolutely plenty of opportunities to do that. If you want to just read more about it, there's you know, so much stuff out there. The trick is figuring out you know, how to narrow that down. Yeah. If anybody wants to get my card, I've got a couple of ideas. I can't think of one single perfect source, but I can point you to a few if you want to just kind of start to get a, a better sense of what's out there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>